Instead of just looking at teachings as scattered and haphazard, and there's a little teaching here, a little teaching there, and then looking at myself and trying to figure out what I need to do and so on and so forth. When you look at Islam from a community perspective, communal perspective, social perspective, all these smart starts with small community and then it gets larger and larger and expands. The guidance we have on that, the importance given to it, are enormous. And there are various specific instructions and general guidelines that we have in regards to community. First and foremost, the importance of having a community, being a community, coming together, forming community. There's a long list of, there's this famous saying from Alamata wa Tawai, in his tafsir al Mizan, he says, There is nothing in Islam that has been mentioned outside the context of community. Ijtima'ah. Believers being to nothing. The most spiritual teachings of Islam are in the context of community, people being together, not outside of it, not individual people 
and looking at them as individuals. It's in a social contact, it's a community. It's a gathering of people coming together, convening. Whether it's the Jama'a prayers, or simply even all the emphasis of do your prayers in the mosque, that creates naturally an environment where people come together. You have been given a center, which is the masjid, the mosque. We had an earlier, at another brother's house, we were talking about this, how it's important that we build masjids. Masjid. Masjid is a place of worship of Allah. It's the house of Allah. If we were to go over the hadith. So all that emphasis is that you do your prayers. And how many prayers do we have? We say five times a day, which we reduce that usually to three times a day. But how many prayers do you have? Even if you come for the Nawafa, which we're told to do that, go to the masjid. It's just calling people to come together for those very spiritual acts. It took off very spiritual instruction in Islam. Where do you do it? In the masjid. So when everybody's told, do it in the masjid, what's going to happen? People are going to leave their homes for worship. Where are they going to come? They're going to come to the masjid. They're going to convene again, the convention, a gathering of believers in the masjid. For what? For spiritual, for fasting, for keeping away from talking from about the dunya, engaging in recitation of Quran, engaging in prayer, and so on and so forth. Naturally, it creates an environment that calls people together, doing even these most spiritual and to some most personal parts of their lives, bring it back to everything else that you have. Some this was. Something that people think, oh, you know, you want to be spiritual, you want to do this, you know, find a corner in your house. Actually, when you look at Islam, you think, no, find a corner in the masjid. And when it's a corner in the masjid, then everybody else is going to be there too. Like Just get rid of the nafs. Don't do it for them. Be there. Do it in their presence. Don't do it for them. Do it for God. And if you think you can hide somewhere and get rid of that, you can't. The only way to get rid of that riyah is to be there. And do it and not do it for them, do it for him. You can do 20 years of in the closet, you know, just do your prayers. But the moment you do that prayer in front of everybody else, you do it for them, not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you haven't practiced it. From the beginning of Islam, didn't say do that. No. Even for going out of leaving your day-to-day -day activities and engaging in worship, the solution, the instruction of Islam is it take off. Where do you do that? No, sure. Everybody is called to it. The Prophet called everyone. And where's the master? Even if they don't come all for it, to for the prayers, they come to the same master. Sir. You're with people. You're with people. Then all the emphasis that we have on building that community. You have a lot of emphasis on the importance of building that community. And although we're not too familiar with this, because we have not studied it, I guess. We've moved away from it, we haven't thought about this. Islam actually gives us solutions for community building. Not necessarily some hadith found somewhere, but that's one of the mistakes we make. One of the mistakes we make, I'll give you another example, on Wulat al Faqih, for example. Some even learned people, when they want to discuss the concept of Wulat al Faqih, they're like, give me a sentence that this imam or that imam has said that says, al like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, your approach is wrong. Who said that uh, you're going to go and find or you should understand Islamic teachings in that way? Look at the seerah of the Ahlul Bayt. Look at how they behaved. Look at what they did. Look at their plans. Leading to the minor occultation. During the occultation, look at that. Read all of that, understand their tactics, understand their strategies. When you understand that, then with that understanding, go to the hadith Anmal Hawadith al Waqaf, Farjaw Fiha Then that makes a whole different sense. It's a completely different statement. When you just hear, oh, in the Imam during the minor occultation, he has this line that says, Anmal Hawadith al Waqaf, Farjaw Fiha, which means whatever happens, go to the ulama. Okay. You hear that, it's a small sentence, then. Everybody wants to look at the wording. Well, did it mean this? Did it mean that? You're missing the bigger picture here. Just look at the conduct of the other day. There are serious strategists. 
They had a goal, they had an objective, they had strategies for getting there, and they had tactics for it. They planned for it very, very seriously. You're leaving all of that out, and like, can you explain to me how this piece of text here is going to mean that? No, you're missing the bigger portion of instruction. Community building, now that's also related to this, but on a more advanced level, when you have a strong enough community, a presence of enough members that have a close enough understanding to one another to be able to establish an Islamic government, which I'm not overseeing now in the Islamic public, and it's growing in the region, by the way, if you haven't noticed. That's more advanced. What's Islam's solution for community building when you're a minority? How do you do this? How do you make your communities grow? What's the Ahlul solution for this? I'm going to present a solution that I firmly believe in. And the more I've looked at the history of the Ahlul Bayt themselves, and I'll try to briefly mention a few points regarding that. And also I looked at the history of the major occultation, where the ulama learning from the Ahlul Bayt have carried on the responsibility of, in the absence of the Imam, based on the instructions of the Imam leading the community of believers throughout that region, and as it's expanded, they have also expanded. We see their strategy being the same. It follows the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. So before Karbala, the circumstances were one way. I won't get into why, it's a little different. We'll start with after Kalbala. What did Imam Zain Abidin do? He starts from, according to Ahadith, from scratch. There, aren't, there isn't currently a community. Not necessarily right after uh, Ashura, because although there were people that, like Suleiman ibn Surat al-Khuzari, or Khazari, who ended up going and becoming part of the Tawabin, he's there, he was part of the movement of the Ahlul Bayhi, ended up not going to Kalbala which was a mistake, he was still there right after Kabbalah, however, right? So there's those people, however, the very fact that they didn't come to Kabbalah disconnected them from Imam. And therefore, even their act to go as Tawabin, 4,000 people all got massacred, that wasn't upon the instructions of the Imam. The connection with the Imam was lost, that was no longer the community of the Imam. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein worked for that community for 20 years between the treaty all the way until Karbala, that point onwards, those who didn't join, that whether they liked it or not, that's it. They disconnected, therefore they did not follow Imam Zayn al-Abidin after Kabbalah. Imam Zayn al started from scratch. So how did he get from uh, a zero community, it's just his family, to where at the time of Imam Sadiq, people come in dozens from Khurasan and say, Imam, you have a hundred thousand people, their swords ready to have an uprising. How do you go, how do they go from there? Just the family to that point. That just kept growing and it grew and further and further. It's amazing. One of the companions comes from Sajistan, as the Arabs called it, or Sistan, right there, right by Sindh, obviously. Another last Iranian province, which these borders are more recent in terms of regions that was Sistan or Sajistan. And then I believe on the other side of it, I don't know if it's Baluchistan first, and then Sen, those areas. I don't know if previously that was called Baluchistan, because Baluchistan is a little further uh, north, I believe, in, in Iran, or maybe I got the other way around. Anyhow, so that area of Sajistan, southeast of Iran, which I don't think it's limited to the Iranian border today, I think it ex extends into uh, Pakistan uh, originally. Anyhow, there's a, uh, uh, a believer that goes to the Imam, and I believe it's in the time of the later, or around maybe Imam, Imam Jawad's time, if I get this right, maybe a little earlier, or later, but around that time, roughly. He goes to the Imam and he complains about uh, the situation there, and he says the, uh, the governor is charging me something extra or taking something away from me, or something along those lines. And what the Imam does is that he writes a letter to him, to that governor, and tells him, gives him specific instructions how to treat this person and so on and so forth. 
What that tells us, what we understand from that, the, the response he gets from the governor, the governor within the Abbasid government of that region is a Shia of the end. I've mentioned this before, maybe you've heard. At the time of uh, Imam Jawad, I believe, Yes, it's Imam al-Jawad sallallahu alayhi time, where he was very young when he became an Imam. He was only 25 when he was martyred. So he was very young when his Imam had begun at age 8. Uh, one of the Wuzara, the ministers of uh, the Abbasids at the time, which were uh, Ibn Khaqan. Khaqan were people that were brought from Central Asia. They have the Turkish background. And the origin of the Turks is actually Central Asia, not currently Turkey. The Turks conquered that area and they took their culture and language over there. Anyhow, so Ibn Khalqan has a son who's a Nasibi. He hates the Ahlubi. He was in Qom, then he transferred back to uh, San al -Ram. And he says that I was amazed or astonished or shocked, I think a better word would be. One day they announced, they told my uh, father Ibn al-Ridha. They knew the Imam's after Imam al Ibn al because the Imam became a uh, more well-known person in uh, the Muslim Empire. So they were known as Ibn al Said Ibn al is coming. He lined up all his guards from the entrance of the house, or you know, I guess in yard two, the actual entrance of the building, uh, out of respect. And the Imam was walked all the way in, and he had obviously he's a minister, he's got a place where he's sitting, he takes care of his affairs. When the Imam came, he stood up, he went forward to him, greeted him, brought him, and put him where he was sitting. And then he turned around and sat in front of him the way slaves sit in front in front of their masters. And he said, you know, the way he was respecting him, he was baffled. What's going on? Who's, who's this person? I didn't know him, he says. Then while he was sitting, his guards and came and said, the Khalifa is coming. And now you expect, this is the wazir, the minister of the Khalifa. How does he respond? He acts as though he hasn't heard anything. Just sitting there in the presence of the Imam, not moving, listening, or whatever the conversation is. Continue, continue, they keep coming up. He entered the house. Finally, towards the end, he apologizes to the Imam. He said, no, this guy is coming. If it's possible for you, you know, if you can step into the back room, and the Imam goes to the back room, Khalifa comes, no such respect whatsoever. And then he gets up and he's, this child is baffled, what's going on? Ibn Khalqan, the wazir, the minister of the Abbasid, high-ranking, one of the top-ranking officials of the Abbasids, is at least a strong lover of the Ahlul Bayt, if we don't say he's a Shia, okay, a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, believing in the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. These are instances I'm trying to get us to stop thinking that the Ahlul Bayt were just these Muslim people that, you know, they, they, they just said things and people killed them for no reason. No, there was a huge uh, movement lined up behind the Imams, which is why people got angry at them. So how did they go from nobody, Imam Zayn al din from scratch, to where at the time Imam Sadaq you have that, and then it grew further and further. Imam Khalid's life is amazing. He disappeared suddenly, not literally, but he left his city, he went to, he was in areas of Sham, and then Daydam, which is the northern region of, of Iran. What exactly was he doing? But he had followers there. He was visiting these different communities. How did the Imam go from that or the Imams over the course of what? The year 61 after the Hijrah? The year 140. 148 is the Shahada of Imam al right? What's that? How many years is that? 80 plus. Around 80, maybe something. Less than 100 years. How did the Imams do this? What was there? I'll try to make it short because we can do an extended version of this and uh, talk a lot more about it and give a lot more details, but because the time is limited, as his brother mentioned, we have other I guess, activities after this um, somewhere else, before the night program. 
You've heard of figures, I'll start with common knowledge that you know. You have heard of Abu Hamza al thumari He's the companion of Imam Zayn al What you don't know is that he's one of the later companions of Imam Zayn al He's got earlier companions, like Abu Khalid al Kawbi. Okay. But whichever, Imam Zayn al Abidin, in a very clever, powerful, uh, and secretive way, because they were under surveillance and they were afraid, they knew they're like magnets and they will draw people to them and create a movement. They knew they don't accept the authority of the Umayyads. So with all that, the Imam very gradually, very subtly brought people and taught them, taught them. They became people is an amazing Hollywood scholar. Imam Zayn al didn't give a lot of speeches. What did he do? He trained scholars. Abu Khalid al Kabri, Abu Hamza al Thumayyad. And training scholars, what did it mean? It meant give knowledge and train spiritually. A person has got to. In order to be the students of the Imam, but they worked on to develop and train that person to the student was not to just feed them information. We have a number of hadith, just to back this, it can be, as I said, addressed in so many different ways. We have a number of hadith that says, You're not an Adam if you don't act based on your knowledge. Islamic knowledge is like that. You're not an Adam if you. So if you learn something, that's telling you the type of guidance that Imam Zayn al gives. The knowledge he gives you comes with you enacting it, putting it into practice, implementing it. If you don't, you're not an Imam Zayn al abidin taught a few of these individuals. So then instead of being Imam Zayn al abidin that is going to go and speak here and there, spread the information, you have a figure like Abu Khalid al Kabuli. From Kabul, obviously, you know where that is. After a few years, after, it's not clear to me how many years, but after he got fully trained, the Imam, in a very interesting way, which I don't want to address the details, the Imam had him sent to, back to Kabul, his hometown. And then you see that that region is actually where they had the uprising against the Umayyads in the name of the Ahlul Bayt. You see that they come from Khurasan. I don't know if, if Kabul was actually considered part of Khurasan region. It's obviously not part of Khurasan of current day Iran, but Khurasan was definitely, definitely larger, including parts of Turkmenistan. But I don't think it went as far as, uh, as far east as, as Kabul. But you can see the effect. The Umayyad's effect wasn't to love the Ahlul Bayt, to know the Ahlul Bayt, to want their government. They badmouthed the, the Ahlul Bayt. Where did the goodness and the love of the Ahlul Bayt come in this region. If you connect the dots, the only thing you can pinpoint is the likes of Abu Khalid al Kabuli. Trace it back to you. He is, in my understanding, doing the math, he is the source of this. Imam Sadiq's students move from Kufa, um, Kufa was a center of knowledge, and although, as we said, they got disconnected from the Imams, however, the love of the Ahlul Bayt, the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt, still was strong in Kufa. There was a disconnect, but that notion, knowing there, there were the Ahlul Bayt, there's Ayyub Nadi Talib, there's Hassan ibn Ali, Hussein ibn Ali, and all of the made a big mistake in Karbala and so on. But still, the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt and who these people were, was there. So many people went from Kufa, they started gaining knowledge, becoming students of the Imams. Imam Baqir had numerous students from Kufa. They went to Medina, they got trained. Went back to Kufa, and then some started going to Qom. Some started going to Qom. You have people, there's a graveyard or cemetery in Qom called Shaykhan. You 
I would visit again, ask for the Sanjur of Shaykh Khan. It's right outside of the Haram of Bim Asma Sallallahu Alaihi If you go there, there's a couple of graves. These are the companions of Imam Sadiq Sallallahu Buried there. They moved. They moved. And then more people moved. Qum became a center of the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt. And then from Qum, none of these ulama go where? They go to Ray. Tehran didn't exist at the time. It was some village somewhere. Besides how what? In Ray, which was a larger city, almost a village at the time, these ulama, they left, they went to Ray, established themselves. And then from there to other areas. During the minor occultation, we have another individual trained in Kufa or Baghdad. It's not clear to me. I'm pretty pretty sure he got trained in, in Iraq. His name is Al Ayashi. He's from around Samarkand which is again in Central Asia, it's current day Uzbekistan. He went, got trained, he has a tafsir, a bottom tafsir, tafsir al-Ayashi. He went back to his region, he started training students over there. The, in the Rajal books, Rajal Keshi, which is Keshi, is another city close to Samadhan, he's one of the students of al-Ayashi. Again, you see this, happening there. The description of Ayashi is that his house was the center of gathering for the believers. Okay. He was wealthy. He, his, his had, he had inheritance before going to uh, that region. Getting trained, coming back, and then he used all of that to bring people in, teach them about Islam, and train students. One of them is Abu Hamr al kashi another great scholar that we have from that region. And Tashayyur spread like this. This is how Tashayyur spread. This is how the numbers grew. So. And then you look at the Ahadith, it says a number, too many Ahadith. Mujalisatul ulama, not people like me, ulama. Mujalisatul ulama, all the emphasis. Stick around ulama, be around ulama. Sit in the presence of ulama. Looking at an alim is ibadah, and so on and so forth. Right? So you hear that you love the Ahlul Bayt, who do you gravitate towards? You start gravitating towards these centers, and centers are created around what? Not around a building, around someone. If you think you have the benefits that you, you do in this community, whether you know it or not, it's because of Sayyid Abba Sayyid. This is a man, he's learned, he's learned the knowledge of the Ahlul and to the best of his ability, which is a lot, he's implemented all of those teachings. God based on what he understands Islam to say. When you have someone like that, you gravitate towards, it gives you life. It gives the community life. Build centers without that figure, like this center is going to get us somewhere. It's not the building, it's not the structure. That structure can become the center of Shaitan himself, the devil himself. If we don't gravitate towards the knowledge of the Ahlul the way the Ahlul Bayt, so all these Ahadith, why do we have so many Ahadith? Let's not lose the trend of thought we're saying. How did the community of believers grow? This is how it grew. The Imams trained students. They sent them to regions. They trained students locally there. And it grew. This, that Adam became not just a lecturer. They trained students in that area. That's how it grew in Kufa. The students of the Ahlul Bayt moving to Kufa, they started training others. Zurara ibn Aqiyan has a student, Haris ibn Abdullah al Sajistani. He was known as al Sajistani, which means Sistani in Arabic at the time. 
because he had a lot of trade and business with Sajistan, he would go back and forth. Otherwise, he's from Kufa, he's Kufi. Zurara is a student of Imam Sadr. He spent a lot of time learning as a young new convert to Tashayyu, they were Sunni. They became Shia, him and his brothers, Abdul Malik, Hakra, others. They became Shia, these were the brothers of Zurara, and the main figure there being Zurara. They went and learned as a young man, he, went, he learned from Imam al-Baqir sallallahu in his trips, he had travels, he went to Medina, and then with Imam Sadat, and then there were a couple of years that Imam Sadat was sent to exile uh, around Kufa, and they would go to him and ask him questions. He learned, then he started training people. Hadith ibn Abdullah said, your son is a student of Zorah, not a direct student of the Imam, although he lived at the time of the Imam. They created these figures who then became an uh, individual that spread the culture of the Ahlul Bayt, not the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt only, the whole package. Kufa, <coughs> Um, Ray. And if you look at ulama, post minor occultation, during the major occultation, we see the same thing happen. Ulama who went to India, they set up Hawza. They started teaching people, training people, not just giving lectures, general lectures, and masab and all of that. No, they started training students as the next generation of scholars in that region. Qom was training students, Najaf was training students, Baghdad was, at a time Hilla was the center. Ulama came from Jabal Ahmed, Syria, Lebanon area, Shaman. They learned it, they went back to establish the house they started training the students. And that grew. And then whenever you see, it's interesting also, whenever you look at any part of our history, in any region, whenever the house of God stronger, you have stronger ulama present, you see that community flourish more and grow more. And you see the house going down, you see the community growing. There are plenty of examples, some that we're familiar with. Jabal Ahmed was a center of Tashayyu, it was a center of, of knowledge, and you had all those great ulama that you had. Hausa went down, look at the Shias from southern Lebanon before the revolution, before Hezbollah and all of them. How much did they know of Islam? You looked at them, you didn't think they're Muslim. Forget about the robbers of the Arab Bay. No hijab, no nothing. The Sheikh Shirri in uh, Dearborn, those immigrants had, had migrated to the U.S. way before all that, in the early, I, 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 what I've heard is in the 20s. When he first moved over there, he had to allow them and beg them to come to the masjid with their mini skirts. Please, just come to the masjid. And gradually, gradually, now you see you know, a lot of hijabat and all of what you're seeing now. And it's still not everybody, by the way. But, Sheikh Shirley, again, another example right there. You have an alim coming in to whatever ability he had, and you see the impact of it in the community. The house in Jabal Alam, uh, Ahmed goes down. This is Aitam al Muhammad, the Shia there, become what you see. Besides Allah, please. No. No. Sheikh Abdul Karim Hari moves back to Qom. You know the Hausa in the Islamic Republic, what we know currently of the Islamic Republic. There's numerous cities, and I'll maybe mention a couple of examples like that too. During the Safavids time, their capital was Isfahan for reasons that didn't really have too much to do with the intentions of the Safavid rulers. There were kings, they were they're not good people. Ulama took advantage of that uh, for Tashayyu and they spread, they wrote books, gathered material, expanded and extended the shrines of Imam Rida and the Ahlul Bayt inside Iran and also the Hawzat, they did that. Isfahan became a center of knowledge at the time. 
Actually, Safavids in the early 10th or around the 10th, 11th century after the Hijrah. And they came from different, various regions. You have Sheikh Khurul Amini, his father, also coming from Jabal Ahmed. Sheikh Bahai, his father, both of them coming from Jabal Ahmed. They came over there, they settled, and it, it started flourishing. Right? So, the, the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt started expanding. Tashayyu increased. The number of Shia in the country increased. A lot of Sunnis converted. And then the scholars went again in other areas. Some of you may know Sayyidina Matullah Jazawiri. Well, he was based in, uh, in Isfahan as well. He left Isfahan to establish himself in Shushat. He went to Shushat and his progeny are there. The Sadat Jazawiri are all. As far as I know, I could be missing something. My, my information goes in. Then from there, they, they went and spread to other areas. Some went to India and elsewhere. <coughs> different parts of Iran they gone to. But he went to Shushat. Again, he established the Hawza. So, training students there. Then after that, gradually, the houses started going down. And by the way, you, have, you still have the house of Nisfahan, you have the house in Tabriz, you have house in Mashhad, you have house in Qom, from the time of the Ahlui, but the one in Qom had gone down. Sheikh Abdul Karim Hari, Imam Khomeini's teacher, he moved back from Najaf, a graduate of Najaf, came, first went to his hometown, Arak, he's Araki. When there they started something, it didn't work out, they decided for whatever various reasons, they moved to Qom. Imam Khomeini and Sheikh Abdul Karim's son, Sheikh Muntaza Hawari, and others, like Abdul Qaygan, Abdul Manachi, perhaps to a degree, uh, but more so Abdul Qaygan, Imam Khomeini, and Sheikh Abdul Karim's son, Sheikh Muntaza Hawari, they became the students. This is when Qom started picking up. Sheikh Abdul Karim passed away, after a while they brought who? Abdul Qaygan. And it kept growing, and then Imam, with this foundation is where it developed to a point where they could actually establish an Islamic government. What's the basis of it? This is the policy of the Arabic. They train students, real students, ulama, rabbaniyin, someone with knowledge that implements it. And it didn't just happen when these people decided to do it. No, the community came together and made this happen. The knowledge and the spirituality came, but everybody had to come and do things hand in hand. They came together and made it happen. Without the others who were involved, it would not have been possible to be. He had a bait. The homes that you hear, and we know it's a responsibility everybody pays to the amount of our time, and according to the Ahadith, in their absence, what I want they could read, just a very basic uh, uh, book that I can refer everybody to for them to learn, uh, if they have any questions on this. The most important expense of homes is. Where did he get that from? For himself? Look at the history. That's what the Imams did. That's what the Ahlulbayt did. There's a whole system there. But the pillar of this is the house. And the spread of the house. The spread of the house. Ulama who went to regions, they established the Hawza there. Yes, there's a Hawza in Najaf, but Sheikh Al Ayashi, when he moves to Samarkand, he doesn't say, well, people can go. No, he starts training people there. They become great scholars in that region. If we're looking for building community, we need to look at these. Study. This is my understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. I believe in this. Between me and Allah. And I will do everything I can to make this happen. Because I clearly see this is the method of the Ahlul Bayt. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One of the things that we have, one of the 
and the, the Western way of doing things is where you go and promote. You promote yourself. Okay, you're supposed to go and promote yourself. You go and you promote your your uh, project, and, and you give it a good face. And there's loads of techniques of doing that. And I think you all, or some of you at least, are very good at that. And you help people do that. It's very egoistic. You know, it's my thing. Have to put your name all over it. And... That's not what Islam teaches. Islam, the tabligh of Islam, I thought had, I thought only had a very interesting. I love blessing. I like to give him a long life. Take from my life, give it to him. An amazing person. Clearly representative of the twelfth. Clearly. If you don't see it, then I'm sorry for you. Very honestly, I hope God opens all of our hearts to it. I didn't always believe in this to the extent I always uh, have been a supporter and advice, but understanding this, no, I haven't always understood it in this way. I'm the law opening my eyes to certain things I realize, no, definitely. And the more I look into, read, listen to his understanding of Islam and check back at the sources and look at others, and clearly a difference. This is just a completely different. Different understanding, different connection. We're talking about tabligh in Islam. <coughs> the objective of tabligh in Islam is to bring people to a common understanding of the truth, and everybody motivates themselves and we help each other understand what the goal is and work together towards accomplishing that. Not, I'm doing this and I want you guys to come. That's not the Islamic approach. No, the Islamic approach is, look, you understand something to be right? Talk about it and explain it. If somebody criticizes you and says, no, that's not right, hear them out. And if they're really right and what you were saying is not right, take it back. So, okay, this is not correct. Tabi isn't about like promoting... Uh, not mentioning all any of the negatives, not mentioning any of the problems, and just, oh, the Apple phone, this, that, the other. Well, it's got issues as well. Okay. Well, you're promoting it. You know it, but you want to sell the product. That's not Islam. How is Islam the You don't promote yourself. You promote the haq. This is the haq. And we should move towards it. And if you understand what that is, if you also believe in it, it's your taqlid between you and Allah. The Prophet is told. The Quran is amazing. This is where that understanding comes from. This is where this understanding comes from. So in tawalla wa qul hasbi Allah la ilaha illa huwa alayhi tawakkal wa huwa rabbu al-arsh al-azim. If they turn their back, this is in the last verse of Surah Tawbah, check it. Surah Tawbah, there's a lot of emphasis at the beginning of that page. It says, Jahid al-Kufar wa al-Munafiqeen wa al alayhim. Fight the Kufar and fight the Munafiqeen. People that are within your ranks. They act as believers, they call themselves believers, they call themselves Shia, they're beating their chest. Jahid al-Kufar wa al-Munafiqeen wa al alayhim. And a lot of emphasis on that responsibility, at the end of the chapter, God tells the Prophet, so in Tawalla, if all these people turn their backs on you, all the Muslims, this is, so it's the Surah chapter of Bala'a or uh, Tawbah, right? This is revealed in the eighth year after the Hijrah. That's 21 years of the work of the Prophet. Now you have a community. God reminds them, that in Tawalla, if they all turn away from you, فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ if they all turn their backs, say, God is sufficient for me. There is no Lord but Him. There is no Ilah but Him. There is no one who is worshipped by Him. Only on Him do I rely. I don't rely on anyone else. He is the Lord of a great throne. In other words, the throne. He's in charge of everything. I rely on him. I rely on the Prophet. Yeah, when you do tabligh, Islamic tabligh, it's not about, hey guys, no, it's not, 
This is what the truth is. This is what needs to happen. This is the understanding, looking at what the other bait is. If you think this is something that the other bait have done, it's your time between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My responsibility is to share what I understand the taklif is. Besides that, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيِّ تَوَكَّلْتُمْ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْحَشْنَةِ And he makes things yes. The Prophet never relied on the people. Everything he said. When God says in the Quran, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهِ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا Who is there to give, lend God money? And afterwards God says, if you give, it's good for you. If you don't give, give. then no one will give you the money. God is all sufficient. All praises to him. It's not for him that he's asking you. It's for you that he's asking. For inside you will mean ajr. For what level? If I ask you for a reward, the love of the Ahlul Bayt, according to the verse of the Quran, is a reward of profit. Or the other verse says, I didn't ask you for a reward for myself. It's for you. If I ask you for a reward, it's for you. You love Muhammad Hussain. It's for you. It benefits you. You kill an Ahmad Hussain, it's, you're doing yourself harm. You're not doing Hussain wrong. Hussain becomes Sayyid al Shahada because of what you did. He doesn't lose. Ali and Al Asqa, a baby, a six month old baby, is where people of all ages beg for Shiva. He didn't lose anything, you lost everything. Imam Hussain didn't beg you to come. He never begged. He said, this is the right thing to do. You want to come? Good for you. You don't want to come? Fine. But you'll lose. On the day of Ashura, in the morning, he addressed the people. He said, do you not know who I am? What, Imam Hussain is begging? No. He's worried about himself? Absolutely not. But he's going to keep to remind you for your own good. I'm good. I'm waiting for it. I prayed for Shahada. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm waiting Sallallahu How were the children able to walk 
بانک یکم سنی به ملمون زن تنشنلی واقی به فاملی Family of the Imam al Hussain. From between the battlefield to put salt on their wounds, to make them see as much as Zainab perhaps tried to keep the children away, for them not to see the bodies of their fathers and uncles. The Malawons walk and through the <coughs> When Zainab entered Karbala, <coughs> Abbas was there to respect her. <coughs> Ali Akbar was there, unmounting from her camel, coming down. The Maharam were there to help her. I don't know now, after she helped all the children and others mount their camels, how she mounted her camels. <laughs> from her brother, <laughs> seeing her brother's head on the square in Kufa. Of 
the oppression, they're facing the middle of the world.